on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I can't tell you how many times people say, yeah, I was out today, didn't see anything. It's like, yeah, but you didn't see the flowering rose bush, a wood frog, that salamander, or you didn't see the birds. You saw nothing, really? Here we are going, wow, I'm an alien on my own planet. I don't even know anything in my backyard. And you're sort of opening that door for people. I remember what it's like to not know this information. And so I'm very intentional when I put all that into my videos and I just try to cut out the fluff. One of the really dirty secrets of foragers is that we are technically and legally sometimes Sometimes stealing plants from private landowners. I don't think that foragers are the main issue out there. Like the amateur mycologists who aren't professionals, they drive the science so much because they're out there in the field studying these things, finding new species. I just encourage people to be intentional whenever you're out there foraging. Don't treat it like a grocery store. Get to know each organism individually whenever you forage it. Episode number 39 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Learn Your Land. Getting to Know Mushrooms and Plants with Adam Harriton is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival was built on the uncommon but powerful premise of self-health care. The idea that ultimately it's you who's responsible for your own health. Never before has it been more clear. While governments, health agencies, and medical professionals are scrambling to create policies and treatments for the masses, the wise amongst us have been busy building the strongest, healthiest, and most adaptable versions of ourselves that we can. Sir Thrival specializes in time-tested immuno and adaptogenic formulas for modern humans. Right now and for a limited time, every bottle of Sir Thrival's Pine Pollen Pure Potency is $10 off its regular price. Pine Pollen Pure Potency is made with wild-crafted pine pollen, which is rich in phytoandrogens like testosterone, androstenedione, and DHEA, and the formula also features stinging nettle root, which frees your body's natural testosterone Testosterone from sex hormone binding globulin, making it more readily available to your body. And with its real orange peel, maple, and vanilla flavor, it's delicious too. So if you or someone you know would benefit from a natural testosterone boost, have a look at Pure Potency. You can find it at SirThrival.com. Hey, thanks for all those five-star ratings and the incredible reviews over at iTunes. Listen, you only have to do this once to move the needle on how the show gets put in front of new listeners. You just go over to iTunes and hit the five-star rating, assuming you think that we warrant it, and then write up a short but honest review, and you're done. You're done. Anytime you hear me asking, you can think to yourself, I'm all set. I've already given a little back to support Daniel and the Wild Fed team and their mission. It's instant gratification. And please know, we read all those reviews, and they mean a lot to us. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Well, I've just had a great weekend. A lot of it spent out on the salt water. I had a friend in town from Kentucky who came to do some fishing and foraging, and we filled up three days enjoying Maine's landscape and all it has to offer. We spent one of the days offshore fishing for haddock, what tourists often call deep sea fishing. The locals get a chuckle out of that, even though the guides advertise it by that name. We call that type of fishing ground fishing since we're fishing all the way at the bottom, usually at depths between 200 and 300 feet of water. Seas were really rough that day, like hold on tight rough. And two of the folks who came along with us spent most of the trip vomiting over the gunnels. Actually, if you're a regular listener to the show, you'll know one of them, Wild Fed's very own producer, Grant Giuliano. I have to hand it to him, though. He still fished pretty hard, bringing home a respectable catch. So Grant, since I know you're listening, great job. And as he knows, I was in a similar position on a trip earlier this year. Both he and I had never experienced seasickness before, despite some very bad conditions. So it's my opinion that two things people should never say is, I never get seasick and I never get poison ivy. These are two afflictions that can happen rather suddenly, even late in life. But I digress. This was the kind of day that makes you realize just how dangerous it can be to head offshore. 35 miles out, a lot could go wrong, and going overboard in a pair of Grundens and deck boots is a lot more serious than just taking a swim. Still, it's so worth it, coming home with half a winter's worth of filleted fish. Of course, getting home after 10 hours on the water and 4 hours of driving, 
you then have to start the work of processing fish. So even though we left the house at 4 a.m., we didn't finish vacuum sealing our fish until midnight. So it's a long, tough day, but somehow a lot of fun too. The next day we went reishi foraging, gathering enough of one of my favorite mushrooms to use as medicine until next summer rolls around. We sliced those thin and dried them in the summer sun. I use Sir Thrival's reishi formula every day too, but I still like to decoct reishi as a tea for use around the house. It's an awesome immunomodulator and adaptogen and part of my overall strategy for combating some of the health risks associated with modern living. We also geared up for a really serious day of blueberry raking, but unfortunately, our regular spot didn't produce again this year. So that's two years in a row without blueberries from what used to be a really productive area. So now I'm on the search for a new blueberry spot. And then we spent our final day fishing the coastline for striped bass. Actually, first we go out and jig for mackerel to use as bait, but I always keep a few of the bigger ones for dinner in case we don't catch any legal length striped bass. And it's a good thing because even though we caught more than a dozen beautiful fish, none were between the 28 and 35 inches necessary to keep them. Actually, the biggest fish we caught that day was 27 and a half inches, so it was really hard to put that fish back. My wife, Avani, has become a really impressive boat driver, handling the wheel and positioning us for optimal casts. Actually, I think I'll feature that teamwork we do in a future episode of the Wild Fed TV show. We also saw a minke whale, lots of seals, and came home with that feeling that only saltwater plus sun can create. That evening, we had a great meal featuring our fresh mackerel, caught up on some sleep, and then I drove my buddy back to the airport. Not the most relaxing vacation for him, but we had a lot of fun. Mostly, I get really excited to share this place with friends from away. Personally, I really love traveling, but sometimes I feel like it's easy to spend a lot of time getting to know the people and the culture, but not necessarily getting to know the land. And that's where my guest comes in. Adam Harriton is the creator of Learn Your Land, a website and social media brand that helps people get to know the mushrooms and plants in the area where they live. We met 10 years ago when I was still a relatively new teacher and he was attending a workshop where I was one of the featured speakers. And it's been a long time. And when I found his recent work, I honestly didn't realize that it was him. I just thought this guy has a really nice approach to teaching this information to new people. Well, we reconnected for the first time here on this interview and we had a blast. We had a great time talking about developing relationships with our local ecology, why mushroom foragers are so often psychedelic people, and where we see the foraging world headed in the future. Adam's a brilliant guy who's making a really valuable and important contribution to wild food culture. So I hope you enjoy this one. And actually, I feel confident that you will. It's a lot of fun. Make sure you give Adam a follow on his YouTube and social media accounts and check out his website too, learnyourland.com. It's a great resource, especially for folks who are just starting out. And I hope this conversation inspires you to get to know your landscape a little better too. Definitely inspired me. So Adam, if you're listening, I'm signing up for your online mushroom foraging class. Adam Harriton, man, it's been a long time. I think the last time we saw each other, well, we both had pretty long hair back then, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, you remember. Yeah, we did have long hair, but you did not inspire me to have that hair. I had that hair before I knew who you were. <laughs> I've got, I've got to grow it. I've got COVID hair right now. I'm growing it back. Um, where was that in Arizona? That yeah, I think it was. Uh, was it Eden Hot Springs? Is that the name yeah. of it? Yeah, I just remember getting on a plane and getting picked up at the airport and somebody driving me three hours into the desert and then seeing you to, and to kind of the most amazing place there. ever though. Right. I mean, Oh yeah, it was uh, miraculous. I mean, I haven't been back since I would totally go again, but have you been back recently? Yeah, a lot, but I was there, um, earlier this year actually oh, no way. Uh, with my wife. Yeah. So she had never been out there. I don't think she'd really ever been to a hot spring before. Okay. And uh, so we got a couple nights um, to ourselves out there. There was nobody there. Uh, there was people there the first night, but then after. And for people listening, I'm talking about a pretty exclusive, but I don't mean exclusive, fancy, ex exclusive, like rich privileged thing. But I mean like exclusive in the sense that you can't just kind of roll up to this hot spring and get in there yourself. But uh, private hot spring in the desert. There's probably six or so different pools all coming from different springs. And it's not all built up like, um, like many of the hot springs that, uh, people visit in resort style, but it's quite raw on the land. Uh, but it's just an, o an oasis in a chaparral desert. And, uh, man, it's, inc it's just an incredible place. Very healing, huh? Yeah, it was beautiful. I mean, I think I was there after that building burned down, but they haven't reconstructed it or anything, have they? No, no. And and actually the folks who are caretaking the land there have really been cleaning it up. So it's okay. much more back to nature. And then they've been greening it tremendously by, you know, there's just a lot of, um, 
you know, wild mustards there, like a you know oh, wild cool. arugula that's growing there. And they've really opened up. There's a pond where all of the hot springs kind of flow down in and it's just full of wildlife. And yeah, the whole place is greened and clean, man. It's really beautiful. But... Yeah. Maybe I'll make my way back. I don't know how, <laughs> how that would happen, but I harvested uh, uh, my first goji berries there and I saw my first rattlesnake there. So yeah, some yeah. firsts out there in Arizona. <laughs> I saw my, I saw my first rattlesnake bite out there and really, uh, yeah, I did. And, uh, and in fact, I actually had a really ex interesting experience there one day in the early morning, I was out walking in the desert alone. And, uh, I, I remember taking a, a I had a, like my foot coming down my right foot. So all my weights on my left foot, I'm about to step down and I think, wow, that's an awfully round rock <laughs> and it's a coiled rattlesnake. Oh, no way. And it's still cold, right? The sun yeah. had just kind of come up over to where the snake was. So as my foot's right about to come down on him, he sort of lethargically strikes at me and uh, I feel the leg hairs on my leg, on my shin move with the wind that he oh, creates. Man. Like he comes like a you know i mean a centimeter a couple millimeters away from actually striking me but i think i just sort of instinctively fell backwards like my body took over i fell backwards and he he i don't think he was trying that hard cuz he was cold and i realized mm -hmm. wow if i had been struck by him i'm out here alone i got you know half a mile to walk back no way to contact anybody it was a kind of a wake up call but oh that's crazy did yeah. you say you had footwear on or were you barefoot no, I had probably like some Vibram five fingers on or okay. something like that, you know, but, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just a, a real, barefoot. a real, yeah, basically barefoot, a real wake up call, man. Talk to me about, I, I want to tell people about your project, uh, learn your land. It's learn your land.com. Is that right? Yes. Um, which is just an awesome website. And oh, thanks. Um, let's start there. I want to talk about your project and your media channel. And then I want to kind of get some backstory because since I've seen you, obviously a lot's happened. Um, yeah, for sure. Watching some of your video content, uh, you know, you've become quite a naturalist. So uh, start off by, you know, how do you explain your project to people? Yeah. So, I mean, that's what I consider to be a project. Sometimes I use the word business or organization, but it's largely just me going out there with a the camera and documenting what I find uh, where I live, which is a bit north of Pittsburgh in Western Pennsylvania. But I explore uh, maybe a 200 mile radius around here. But it's basically me learning organisms that exist around me, largely plants and mushrooms and trees, though birds are slowly making their way into my content and some other animals as well. And I'm learning this stuff. I'm getting really obsessed with it and enthusiastic and passionate about it. And I teach it to people as well, largely through video content. Though I also have Instagram and Facebook as well, but it seems that most people are finding my content through video. And I started this back in 2014, 2015, so about five or six years, and I've just been continuing it. I don't know when I'll stop doing this kind of content, um, but I have transitioned into some more specialized products like an online course that deals with mushroom hunting, and I do live events as well. So I do travel around mostly the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic, the Great Lakes region, and teach people largely about mushrooms because mushrooms just seem to pay really well these days, more so than plant foraging. <laughs> I don't know why that is. Maybe we can get into that, but that's just what I, I found. I'd like to, to try be to true. figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's fun. I mean, I'm enjoying it. I did not plan for this to happen this way, but it almost feels like an assignment that's been given to me by something or someone. Nobody told me anything. I'm just trying to figure it out and it seems to be working. Yeah, you seem like you're doing a really good job. And I was saying just before we started recording that watching some of your content and seeing how it's organized, um, I was sort of like, man, I wish I had kind of started out my career with a clearer vision in that way. Uh, so you say you didn't intend for it, but it, it does come across as, as very well structured and thought out. Um, your domain's really good, learn your lands, like super simple. And then your videos, one thing I want to say is they're ad free, right? Um, yeah, so completely ad free. A lot of people don't realize that because they're so used to just like getting onto YouTube and sometimes you get ads, sometimes you don't. But uh, yeah, I don't make a single penny on any of those videos on YouTube. I don't even know if I would make much money, but I don't like sitting through ads on YouTube. Yeah. I'm sure you don't yeah. like doing it either. I don't want Keebler sponsoring my video or Ford <laughs> or just some company that I have no association with. Uh, and so it's been ad free since the beginning, but I've been publicizing that it's ad free uh, lately, just so people know yeah, that that's I think what they're should, getting yeah. whenever they watch it. I think that you should. And for me, um, it comes across as a bit, uh, more like a educational project than a business. And so 
you know, it's like that sense of going to the library, you know, if I go yeah, to the bookstore, sure. I expect to see lots of ads, you know, I yeah, know they're going to uh-huh. push me into sales, you know, and I know in addition to books, they're going to have plush toys and puzzles and all, you know, all this kind of stuff. Cause they're trying to make some money off of it. Um, and when I go to the library, I don't expect to be pushed towards commerce. Mm-hmm. So anyway, noticing that with your site, um, it's very clean. It's very well organized. It's well written. Your video content's really beautiful. But um, yeah, it just feels like you're there to get an educational experience. So I do hope that you're figuring out ways to to earn off of it, uh, off of what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, for sure. But, yeah, I've uh, been studying that just as long as I've been studying plants and mushrooms and trees. I good. mean, <laughs> I, I realize that if I want this to work, that I have to study the business and the marketing side as well. Yeah. So, I mean, that's something I don't talk about too often. Sometimes I get into it in interviews like this, but I mean, that's half the work right there, just figuring out how right. to get paid doing this. And mm-hmm. I'm doing all right with it right now. Good, good, man. I'm glad to hear that. Well, anyway, I, I really like the way your website's set up. So you, one of the things that you're doing, it looks like to me, is the 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 video topics, because uh, you sort of, it's like a video blog there, basically, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's basically whatever's in season, whatever I'm going out and finding. Right. So it's right. very up to date. It's not things that I found two years ago, or I'm not right. publishing a video that has to do with like winter foraging right but each, now each entry will is some some written content and then a video yeah and for then sure. that video seems to be named very well for like usability too right so yeah i mean that's all strategic it's all intentional i realize yeah, that i, I mean like when you look at the analytics on youtube if, if you get too specific with something or it's not sensationalist enough i mean all that factors into who's going to click it it's hard, man. When I started this podcast, I really enjoy taking obscure things that get said in the episode and then working those into a title, but they get really bad. The analytics aren't good if I do that. So for instance, episode three of this podcast is called Mean Gene Pisleys and Habitat Design because I'm talking to this bear biologist and she's amazing, Deb Perkins, and she uh, is telling us about this one particular bear, Mean Gene. And at one point we got into this conversation about Pisleys, which are these polar bear, grizzly bear um, hybrids that you know are happening, uh, naturally occurring um, now with some of the sort of warming climate and such. So anyway, we thought that was fun. I like the art of that, but then, uh, nobody listens to it cause they don't know what it's about and they don't want to get into something. They don't know what it is. Right. So it's like, if I had said something like a conversation with a black bear biologist, I, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's or just you like put a more, listicle in there, seven, like seven reasons or something like that. Then you right. Got yeah. More yeah. Reasons. I was seeing how you had done, like I saw one of your recent posts is like, like six orange mushrooms you should know or something like that. (laughs) Yeah, I I could have done anything with that title. I thought, I I doubt people are going to click on a video about orange mushrooms, unless they think they're going to find chanterelles or chicken of the woods in this video, which I do talk about. But by putting that number in there, I was just hoping I would get some more views. Psychology, right? It's so funny because just, you know, as somebody who's somewhat schooled on mushrooms, not really well, but I know a bit. And I look at that and I go like, oh, six. Okay, I can handle this. I know right exactly how to skip around in it now because I know how many mushrooms are in it. It's just, it is good for the, anyway, I, you've done a good job is what I'm trying to say. I'm having to, you know, we have this kind of saying in the company, we talk a lot about killing your darlings because when we do our our show, inevitably there's things that you just love, either that get said or video that you capture or even just pieces of B-roll or something. And then I want so badly for it to be in the episode and it doesn't, you know, it just mm. doesn't work and we have to just kill it. And I, I hate it, you know, oh, but yeah. it's like, you know, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of content between. I don't use either, but yeah. I've been learning some things over the years and I'm going to continue to learn because I mean, the platforms are constantly changing. People's tastes are changing. You just got to stay up to date with it. I mean, if you take a significant time off from all of this, you could be so right. far behind when you come back. And so I'm, I'm constantly trying to watch the field and see what people are doing and seeing what works. Are you a one-man band then? You're doing this whole operation yourself? Yeah, largely. I mean, the video is entirely myself. I mean, I film it. I document it. I research it. I script it. I edit it. I put it online. Uh, as far as the website design, I do hire that out to some other people. Um, and some other things like graphic design here and there. But largely, it's just me going out and doing this stuff. I mean, there's a lot of benefit to that, but there's a lot of downsides as well. Some of my friends say it's a control issue, and I would tend to agree with them on that. But that's like the next <laughs> stage. I'm trying to figure out how to delegate some of these tasks and you can, not you can let work the on brand your control suffer. issues. Work on your control issues later in life. The brand looks good. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll tell them that. <laughs> uh, I was uh, I was just watching your um, I think maybe your most recent. Um, entry, which is about uh, sort of the saga of you watching a uh, pileated woodpecker nest. 
And uh, I was wondering, so that is your footage? You you took all that footage? Yeah, hundred percent. I just got super yeah, lucky. Great job, man. Yeah, thanks. Just, I mean, it's really cool. It's not even a know? fancy camera. I got. I mean, the personal emails I got about that video were not necessarily about like just oh that was a beautiful story. All that it was. What camera were you using? What camera were you yeah, using? Right. What lens right. were you using? <laughs> Honestly, it's just a a fancy point and shoot camera with an incredible zoom. Uh, but because I have a tripod and I, I can just hold it still, right. I was able to capture it pretty well. It's pretty amazing the um, the the barriers to entry for video media that existed a few years back compared to now, where it's like, you know, you can you don't it's not that expensive to get equipment that looks better than you know what te television looked like ten years oh, ago. Oh, for sure. And then, you know, music and editing. So it's like you know, making Wildfed the the video show. It's like it's just really cool that we're able to do this without having to have all that network support. So anyway, I really like, um, what you're doing. Cause I think, and this has been coming up a lot lately. Um, it, you know, I think there was already a lot of people kind of onboarding into wild foods as it was, but then with COVID and then the sort of, you know, political turmoil and in this sense of, you know, largely media created sense of impending doom, uh, that's circulating around right now. I feel like a lot of people are starting to ask themselves questions about how um, strategically placed they are in the world and how much could they handle disruptions to their everyday life, particularly around food and supplies and things like that. And while it's not, you and I know, like, I, I think, I think this is probably fair to say, how unrealistic it is the idea that you could like just go off in the wild and just survive <laughs> you know like, oh, yeah. there's not that much wild anyway and uh and you know it's it's pretty depleted and fragmented and you know it's living off wild foods isn't like an easy thing but a lot of people are are being attracted to it for that reason right now and i feel like uh you know coming to a website like yours it's like oh man this gets cuts through the noise there's no noise there it's so i really like that because i think people are looking for a, an entry point and it's really frustrating to come into something that um you know how it is when you get like a really good field guide for instance that's for scientists and mm -hmm. you just open that thing up and as a lay person you're like oh man i don't even know what any of this is yeah you know I, yeah, pretty exactly. overwhelming a mycological guide for instance can be pretty overwhelming you're like oh i have to like learn basic mycology before I can use this book. And so anyway, the way you've set it up feels very clean and easy. Uh, so I imagine you're um, an important entry <laughs> point for a lot of new folks. And particularly though, as you said before, on mycology and plants. So not a um, protein-based um, wild food thing you're doing. It's a, it's a plant and fungal uh, largely. Is that correct? Yeah, for sure. Mushrooms, plants, trees. Like I said, I'm trying to get into birds and some other things. But honestly, yeah, it's whatever will stand still long enough for me to document it, what's easy <laughs> enough for me to photograph or film, and to go home and research and capture enough footage and put it into video. I mean, if I yeah. could see a lot of wild animals and document them, and I'm sure I could if I spent the time doing it. But at this point, it's almost like I've built my brand around something that the audience expects I'm going to teach about. And I'm happy to continue down that path for some time. But I do understand that I'm going to hit a point where I'm going to have to pivot just to keep sanity within myself and not just burn out on right. the material. Um, but yeah, speaking about just being simple with the material that I present, I think it's because, I mean, I didn't grow up learning this stuff. And so it's very new to me, relatively speaking. And I remember what it's like to not know this information because it wasn't that long ago. And so I can picture myself as a complete beginner and trying to figure out, you know, what steps did I take in order to learn this information? What did I want to hear? What sources did I consult? And what did I like about them? What didn't I like? And I'm very intentional when I put all that into my videos and I just try to cut out the fluff. I do insert some technical stuff in there. And it's interesting because I get comments ranging from, it's great, this is great for beginners, or it's way too advanced, you talk too specifically about things. And I understand I can't please everybody, but it is geared more towards beginners. Um, with a little bit of the intermediate to advanced stuff thrown in there. But it is pretty intentional the way I do present this stuff. When I'm a beginner at something, and I feel like I'm constantly a beginner at something because I'm always wanting to learn new skills or, or new information. And I like when things are made simple for a beginner, but they throw in little bits of technical jargon because I'll pick up on that and I'll start to know that I need to figure out what that means and I'll be listening for it or looking for it or reading for it. So I kind of like a little bit of both, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Tell me about um, 
you said you didn't grow up doing this stuff. And um, I'm really curious since we last saw each other, what's kind of been the journey and how have you ended up, you know, basically starting a career in, in wild foods and, 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 you know, identification and stuff? Yeah, I mean, when we met in 2010, that was literally the beginning of it. I mean, when I tell people I got into this 10 years ago, like that's when I saw you, it was 10 years ago, it was maybe 2009 towards 2010. Um, but that was right at the beginning of it before I cut all that hair off, <laughs> before I removed the bandana <laughs> and gained some weight too, because uh, I was practicing yeah, some you were pretty, little, you were a skinny dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm still pretty skinny, but I've come a lot, I've come 30 pounds since then. Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's, it's been a long journey and I'm not even, I don't know, halfway done with it. There's still so much to learn and so much to do. And I imagine I'll keep changing as I continue forward in life, but it was really guided by health and nutrition early on. I mean, that's how I got into this yeah. stuff. Before all this, I mean, I wasn't raised as a wild child or like raised out in the woods or anything. Now, I spent time outside. I was fortunate to be part of probably the last generation where kids were still outside a lot without parental supervision. But nature was always just like a backdrop. It was always just like the playing field. Uh, I never really interacted mm -hmm. with it in an intimate way. Never collected plants. What year were you born? Uh, 86. Mm -hmm. um, but I never could identify anything. I remember kicking mushrooms over in the yard rather than like trying to identify them or being mystified by them. But over <laughs> the years, you know, as I got into my teens and early twenties, I realized that food was pretty important and I wasn't really taught anything about diet or nutrition or healthy eating, but I became super fascinated in it. And it was trending at the time as well. So like 2004, five, six, all these like fad diets were coming out and becoming pretty popular. And I jumped on that bandwagon. So I got into the raw foods, I got into the veganism, the vegetarianism and all that stuff. And associated with those movements was also like the wild food culture. Uh, it was just embedded in there. And some of these people were talking about wild foods. And I was fortunate to live less than half a mile away from wild food instructors in the city of Pittsburgh. And they led a wild food walk uh, in the city of Pittsburgh back in 2006 or seven. And for the first time, I actually saw plants as plants. As individuals? Yeah. I mean, before that, I know we keep using the cliche like sea of green or wall of green, but honestly, I never even recognized. I just, I just never saw plants before. Like they were just always <laughs> in the background, like never paid attention whatsoever. Right. I would rather look Props. at buildings. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> But then just pointing out a plant, regardless of whether it was edible or not. It's like, oh my God, there's a plant growing at the base of like a parking meter. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And it planted a <laughs> seed inside of me that, I mean, it didn't germinate right away. It took some time, but uh, I always remember that first event because that kind of set in motion just in the very beginning, everything that would take place later in my life. And then you know how it is. You just become obsessed with things. <laughs> it leads you into, uh, you know, you're hanging out with more wild foodies. You go out foraging. You want to learn this. You want to learn that. Uh, you start a business on it. You end up on a popular podcast and keep going with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that you have an upcoming workshop with Sam Thayer. So, um, you know, to me, Sam is, and, I, and I'm blessed to uh, have, you know, a very close friendship with Arthur Haynes and to uh, live, you know, about an hour from him. So, uh, for those listening, you know, most of the, I think the folks who listen to this podcast are familiar with Arthur's work. Um, you know, to me, he's just one of these top level, um, foragers, you know, wild food people. Um, and Sam Thayer, same thing. I mean, Arthur and Sam, probably two of the greatest minds in wild foods, you know, on the continent, uh, at least, you know, sort of, uh, who don't come from still intact indigenous traditions where some, you know, really, really like old information has been passed forward. But for those of us who come as orphans to this, um, these guys are sort of at the top of it. So I'm also curious how you've come to work with Sam. Cause, uh, you know, like you, if you're saying it's like, like, Oh, I'm just so new to all this, but it's like, Sam's, you know, really at the top of, he's really at the forefront of what's happening in wild foods. I mean, his books, if, if it wasn't for Sam's books, I'd probably still be like a trail nibbler type forager. But, you know, looking at his stuff, it was like, oh, okay, there's a whole another level that you can go to. So I see that you've got something coming up with him. And is he coming out your way? No, I'm going out to Wisconsin to do stuff with him. Uh, oh, cool. He's been out here. Right we've on. done 
in event. I think we just did one event here in Pittsburgh and it was great. People loved it because he doesn't always come out here to Western Pennsylvania, even though he loves Western Pennsylvania. And I don't want to talk about him like behind his back. So I hope he listens to this. Uh, maybe I'll send this <laughs> podcast to him, but yeah, Sam's great. Uh, his whole family's great. He was just out here, uh, yeah, camping with enough. us in uh, cook forest, which is an old growth forest in Western Pennsylvania a couple weeks ago. Uh, so we've become friends over the years and it literally started with an email from him to me and I couldn't believe it. Like seeing Sam Thayer signing an email to me in 2016, like I remember it vividly, like, oh my God, Sam Thayer emailed me. I can't believe it. And he was just so humble about it. Just like so calm and so cool. Just saying, hey, I heard you had a wild food blog. Checked it out. It's really cool. I might be coming out to Western Pennsylvania to look for some plants. Maybe you can help me out. And I said, yeah, oh, for sure. That's cool. So he was looking for a couple trees and plants uh, for a field guide that he's working on. So he came out and I was just blown away. I mean, he knows everything when it comes to plants and ecology. <laughs> he he definitely, you know, it's it's like an under promise over deliver thing. Like he's barely, uh, you know, I met him only recently. We I'd had him on the podcast before. We'd spoken on the phone, but I had only met him about oh, probably earlier this year, or late last year. And um he, he's like functions at another level than most humans, right? I agree 100%. It's almost like it's kind of it's kind of like that person who's maybe in Wall Street or in the business world who just functions at this level that you just can't imagine <laughs> how they do it, but then he's focused all that on, into the natural world. For sure. So it makes for this really unique person. Yeah, and it's not just intellect. I mean, he just practices what he preaches. He's just so good with it. Mm -hmm. I've never met anyone like him. But at the same time, he's so humble about it as well. And he's not demeaning. He doesn't talk down about anybody. He just turns it back around on plants and trees and ecology and all of that stuff. But I've learned right. so much from him over the years, and I'm grateful that we formed this friendship. And so I've been teaching at the Midwest Wild Harvest Festival, which is uh, his wife, Melissa's event that they host every year, right around uh, the equinox, I think, uh, in September. Yeah. Are they going to have it this year? No, or? they canceled it this year because of what's going on. So they're going to schedule it for next year. But you should check it out. I mean, it's one of the greatest wild food events that I've been to. And Alan Burgo, who you've had on many times, he's the uh, chef for that event. So the food is just phenomenal. Uh, and there's a lot of people that attend it. And it's, it's great fun. I mean, it's not like a loosely organized event that you might think of whenever you think of like big festivals. Like this one's tight, but it's just wonderful. It's one of the best ones that I've ever been to. All right, man. Yeah, I'd really like to come. I'm kind of reclusive, so I, I tend to not get out that much, but I think it'd be really good for me to do that. So in yeah, maybe 2021. Um, tell me a little bit about some of the trends that you're noticing. I, I mentioned before, you know, it's come up a couple times now that sort of COVID is changing the landscape a little bit. Obviously, events like we just talked about being canceled and um, you seem like really on top of your analytics and whatnot. So I'm kind of curious if you've noticed any changes in, in um, how the public's consuming content about wild food or, or what interest? And are you seeing m any uptick in new folks or anything like that? I mean, just speaking just from the past couple of months with what's been going on, certainly. I mean, when you look in Facebook groups, which is where a lot of the wild foodies hang out these days, a lot of these Facebook groups, I mean, the numbers are just astronomical. How many people have joined these groups and are talking about this stuff? I mean, I think it's flattened out since then. Um, and we'll see if there's another uptick in the future. But just over the past 15 years or so, when I started getting into this, I think with mushrooms in particular, a lot of people are getting into it more so than they're getting into just like plant foraging. I mean, you see it with hunting as well and all this other stuff. But for some reason, it just seems like mushrooms are having their day in the sun. And it's kind of hard to figure out why that is. And I'm, I'm sure you've noticed it as well. Um, well, they were sort of how I onboarded a little bit, to be honest. I mean, I got my initial foraging experiences in a, as a, a, an adult outside of, you know, I was somebody who grew up sort of like if I saw blueberries or I saw raspberries, you know, I'd stop and pick them or whatever. When I was a kid, I had a few plants that I had figured out sort of instinctually. But, but as far as like actual, you know, foraging intentionally, for me, it started with mushrooms. And I think at that time, it was just sort of the beginning of what you're talking about, which has been this decade long excitement around mushrooms. You know, Paul Stamets' mm -hmm. books came out. I think probably Mycelia Running was one that really kind of hit the mainstream a little bit. And, uh, and then there's been all the, the explosion in the culinary aspect too. And I think people, I think people look at mushrooms and they see dollar signs in a way that they don't with plants. Yeah, you're seeing more and more you know of that. I mean, thing. there's like a, 
Yeah. And I don't even just mean that like in a negative way. I mean it like in mm-hmm. a value way, because I think that people understand if they buy mushrooms at Whole Foods or they buy mushrooms grown, at, you know, by local folks at the farmer's market, or if they go to a high-end restaurant and they, you know, they see a wild mushroom dish on the menu, they understand that these things are delicious, highly prized and expensive. And so I feel like people get that with plants. It's like they still don't understand mm. how amazing plants are, but they get it with mushrooms for some reason. So yeah, how, you know, does any of that resonate? Oh yeah. Or, I mean, it's yeah, interesting. There's even this happen. like within a discipline of foraging, I mean, people who are into mushrooms are pretty much just into mushrooms and not into the plants or not mm-hmm. into the trees or not into hunting. I mean, I see this a lot, especially with the younger people just getting into it, but I can't complain because like you, that's how I kind of got into foraging as well. It was largely through the medicinal mushrooms at first. And I think that's how people started getting into it maybe 10 years ago, just because of those fad diets that I talked about before, like medicinal mushrooms were like woven into some of those diets. Like even though you're not supposed to eat raw mushrooms, people in the raw food movement were talking about the superfoods and the super herbs. And you know who I'm talking about with that, but like chaga and rishi and turkey tail and all that stuff. So people would get into it that way. But you see an uptick in people interested in permaculture and eating local and gardening and all this stuff. And so mushrooms fit neatly into that. But you know what? One thing that people don't really talk about, but I think one of the reasons that mushrooms are doing so well these days is because of the increased popularity of image-heavy social media. I mean, social media is so image-heavy today, and mushrooms do really well on Instagram. Oh, they're For sure. And whenever you see somebody post – I mean, you could – You could post a beautiful mushroom and literally get like 2,000 likes on Instagram. And it's ridiculous. Or you could post an ugly one and get nothing, even though that one could be so much more valuable as a fungus or rarer or something like that. And so you're seeing all these people just posting these images and other people who have never seen such a thing before, but realize that, hey, these things are growing in my neck of the woods as well. So they might go out and find something and share a picture of that. And it's just like a trending effect. People are just getting into it, just seeing what other people are posting online and you see this largely on Instagram and Facebook, yeah. clearly not on Twitter as much because there's not as much imagery on there. But I think social media has a lot to do with it. There's a few things I'd like to pick apart in this. You know, one is, you know, and I've sort of exhausted this. If you've listened to any of my episodes, I tend to go into this thing about the differences between, you know, people who are plant foragers, mushroom foragers, hunters, fishers and stuff. Cause I find that there's interesting personality quirks, almost like archetypes for each of mm-hmm. those things. But then I, because I, I'm a real wild food generalist, I, I post pictures of mushrooms, plants, animals, and I'm going to say fish, even though obviously fish are animals. Um, and it's really interesting to see how people respond to these things. Because to me, some of the animals I post are just outrageously beautiful, but they're, it's a, a huge trigger mm-hmm. for a large percentage of the population to see a dead animal. Um, and the idea that you would uh, post a dead animal to some people is just horrific, you know, even if it looks beautiful. Um, then I'll see a picture of, I don't, I guess I've spent enough time thinking about just, these are all life forms. So to me, it's like, well, Hey, a dead mushroom or a dead plant is also something that you killed. I don't see why that's that much different, but, um, it's interesting when you post plants, you really have to find a way to Mm -hmm. make them look good. You know, unless you're photographing like a, a flower or something like that, like trying to make them look good is this whole thing. Animals are just fascinating mm-hmm. to look at, uh, but people get triggered. But like you said, mushrooms, for some reason, it's like an invitation into the fairy oh, yeah. realm for people or something. And they just feel like this, you know, instantly like, oh, I want to be there. I want to be part of it or whatever. So I find that part fascinating. I like that you brought that up. And I, I prefer to post pictures of a mushroom in my hand or in a basket because I'm as a brand, I'm always trying to promote the idea of human use. Mm-hmm. So I don't post as much uh, pictures of things that I'm going to harvest that are still plugged into the ground because it's just not my brand, right? Uh, I'm trying to teach like conservation through use. So I'm curious for you uh, if you do both or if you tend to do one more than the other and then how people respond to that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, lately I've been posting multiple photographs per post, like if I'm going to post something on Instagram. And so usually though, the first image is going to be it in its native habitat. Like I don't pluck it, but I will probably show a photograph if it is like a harvestable thing for food or for medicine or for a utilitarian purpose. But a lot of the stuff I post isn't edible. And so I guess there's no reason for me to be holding it other than to show the size of it 
which a lot of people right. like to see. And no reason to put, rip it up if you're not going to use it. Yeah, because you're also, I would say, just perusing your brand, I get the impression of more of a, na- it's more of a naturalist approach than a uh, consumptive use approach. Is that fair? Yeah, to say, it's a little or, bit of both. And honestly, it kind of started out as the consumptive approach, like with foraging and how you can use these things. And then I just saw a lot of people doing that. And so I think instinctively, I kind of backed away from it and let the other people do that and wanted to showcase that these things can be beautiful and even useful, even if you don't eat something, because that's the question you always get. Oh, like, yeah. can you use it? What's it good for? Even if it's something that you can't eat. And I mean, there's just a million reasons why something could be useful, but it would have nothing to do with a human being using it. And so I kind of like to showcase that stuff as well. Uh, it probably doesn't do very well on social media if I kind of portray it in that way. Obviously, if something's useful, I think more people would relate to it. But I don't mind because, I mean, I'm super interested in learning as much as I can about everything that grows around me, whether a human being can use it or not. Yeah, and in your brand, Learned Your Land, is kind of it makes sense and and i appreciate it because one of the one of the holes and weaknesses in my approach um of like adult learning how to subsist off wild foods or at least begin to is the number of species that i never end up learning mm-hmm. and because you know i spend trying to learn you know in a matter of a few years like what plants mushrooms animals you know what can i fish for what can i you know fowl what can i big game hunt what can i small game hunt it's so much to learn and in particular, when you add the hunting component, I think, and the fishing component, because it's very gear intensive. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're also having to learn all that stuff. So it, it, what ends up happening is people go like, what's, I, people walk with me in the woods and it's just nonstop. What's this? What's this? <laughs> what's this? And when I'm around someone like Arthur Haynes here in the Northeast, or if I'm with Sam out, you know, in the, the Midwest, it's like, you can say that to him over and over and over again, and it'll just, you'll just get answers. And I spent, I feel like I do a lot more I don't know than mm-hmm. I can actually explain. You know, I know the stuff that I know because it's typically what I can use. And then slowly I start learning the stuff outside of those species that I work with. So I'm enjoying, like, for instance, I'm familiar with the pileated woodpecker because it, it lives here and it's so obnoxiously loud and easy <laughs> to spot. Uh, but, and for people listening, that's Woody Woodpecker is modeled on a pileated woodpecker. They are a large bird. I mean, nearly the size of a crow would you oh say? yeah i mean i would even say a little larger but most descriptions do more gracile like yeah, not as sure. bulky it is as a, a big crow. bird it doesn't take up as much space but it's quite large yeah and um but anyway you know watching your video it's like oh man i haven't really ever observed their nest or their nesting behavior or how they rear their young and these are things that i think had we been raised without so much media we would have learned from just being on our landscape and i feel like your project does this thing for people where it's like you weren't ra- you were raised in a built mm-hmm. environment not you but you know everybody listening we were raised in a built environment we were raised in an environment that was technology heavy media intensive i mean i i, I don't think that most of us are ever going to really get our heads around how much media has influenced our neurological development you know how our brains were basically wired by television commercials and brand advertising and jingles and you know, all cartoons and all of these things, right? So here we are going like, wow, I'm an alien on my own planet. I don't even know anything in my backyard. Um, and you're sort of opening that door for people, which I think is just really cool, Adam. But yeah, that's um, so true. And, you anyway, know, it's what I mean interesting is- because it's interesting that you say that. I never thought about it that way. But when I started getting into all of this stuff is when I stopped watching TV, literally. Like the same exact mm-hmm. year that I gave up watching yeah, TV yeah. to a large degree. I just started spending time yeah. outside and you're right. I mean, it does take the place of all of that, but it's just so much more rewarding and it goes without saying, but I think that's why I'm just so obsessed with it right now. Man, I appreciate you saying that. I was getting pretty deep now. Once COVID hit, I was, um, and just to be clear, I, this I'm not talking about the virus. I'm talking about the impact of the human response to this virus. Um, when that started, I got pretty drawn into the media. And then from there, I felt like, you know, it was like a drug addict. Like I got pulled in really deep because all the politics around it and then all the events that started unfolding in the aftermath, um, I just got really, really drawn in. I feel like I hit rock, rock bottom a week ago. <laughs> and uh, my wife was like, dude, what are you doing? You're like poisoning your mind. 
And I, yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen in the Lord of the Rings when uh, Gandalf sets the the guy in Gondor free, who's been like under the spell of Worm Tongue, and he's all aged, and his eyes are cataract over, and he's under a spell, you know. And Gandalf like sets him free, and he loses like thirty years, and he comes back, he has his mind back. Like that's kind of what just happened to me. And I went out to a milkweed field um, to gather milkweed flowers, and it was like everything I love about being in nature mm. came back in like me- media was starting to like push out all the things that I love and care about and do professionally. I was just getting really drawn into this thing. You know, my work had slowed down a lot. Um, you know, everything was kind of on pause for a while. Anyway, I feel like, um, you're absolutely right because once you pull that out, things like television, but now, you know, everybody always goes like, I don't have a TV. It's like, yeah, but do you have <laughs> yeah. the internet. So it's, <laughs> you basically have every channel that has ever existed, everything that's ever been made in media you have access to. So don't tell me you don't have, just I don't care if you don't have cable, you have a laptop. <laughs> um, so anyway, with as we start to draw away from that, it's like the amount of energy mm-hmm. that's freed up to explore our environment, right? It's, it's tremendous. So anyway, going back, I just want to say I appreciated um, the woodpecker uh, episode. And I see that you're posting a lot about fungi that aren't necessarily foods. And I really like that because that's where I'm weak. And that, that's where a lot of us are weak. And, and I also want to say, if you're just into the wild food aspect, which I think is, that's more where I'm at, uh, learning these other species that are associated with that are indicators of a certain habitat, you know, that can be really, really helpful. Understanding what sounds you're hearing in the woods, all those kind of things. So I just, I'm, I'm loving the niche that you're creating, man. I just think it's really cool. Yeah, thanks. And I think with mushrooms, like with people who are interested in mushrooms, I find that after like straddling both communities, being in the plant realm and then the mushroom realm, people who are into mushrooms more so than the people who are into plant foraging want to know what the non-edible species are as well. Uh, because I, I get so many emails on a daily basis about what is this, what is this, what is this? And it's usually non-edible mushrooms. People just want to yeah. know what they are, but not many people are taking pictures of sedges and grasses That's it. That's and these it. like crazy species and like, for lack of a better term, weeds that a lot of people just overlook and wondering what they are. But with the mushrooms, I think just because they are so ephemeral, so temporary and beautiful, I mean, just to look at, people want to know what they are. And that's why I try to focus on that stuff as well, regardless of whether they're edible or not. And in many cases, they actually are edible because surprisingly, very few species are poisonous in the fungal kingdom. There's just so many species out there. Clearly, there are some deadly poisonous ones that are quite common. But I mean, most of the ones that are inedible that I talk about in my videos, they're actually edible. They're just not that good. You know, let's talk about that for a second, because going back to what you said a moment ago, the you were talking about that wall of green, you know, that sea of green. So Mm -hmm. um, that's that idea that that people who aren't really um, haven't been introduced to the plant realm tend to not see individuals, but just of, of species, right? It's like, it's like if you and I are walking through the forest, you get to that place where you're not doing it on purpose. You're just like making mental notes. Oh, there's oaks over there. There are red oaks. Oh, those are white oaks. Oh, okay. There's birches here. Oh, there's, you know, ashes over there. Like you just start to pick out individuals and see them and notice what they're doing. But to the average person, you can walk through the woods to them and it's just trees, you know, and you're like, no, it's not just trees. It's actually a whole bunch of individual trees and, you know, groups and things like that. So mushrooms stand out from the sea of green. So I think in that way, that gets people's attention um, and makes it, you know, they're they're easier to sort of spot and they're kind of exciting to spot. Mm -hmm. But I also want to talk about this piece uh, and get your feedback on it. Um, Ecologically, I'm kind of glad that people are so drawn to mushrooms because it feels like that's a, it seems to me that it's a lot more ecologically sound for people to explore until they learn like really good Mm -hmm. foraging ethics uh, where, you know, harvesting of mushrooms doesn't tend to deplete the landscape the way harvesting of plants could. Uh, so, you know, any thoughts on that, uh, from, a from an ecological sustainability, especially when, when people are new, I notice they're so excited to take kind of anything, you know, sometimes they'll take, you know how it is. It's like, well, this chicken of the woods, mushrooms kind of old and dried out and too fibrous, but I'm going to take it anyway and try to eat it, you know? <laughs> I've, I've yeah. Been there. You know, cause at first, that was the first two years. Yeah, of my <laughs> exactly. But you know, that can be more of a problem with plants, um, because you can deplete you know, Mm -hmm. landscape a little bit. So yeah, just curious how you, how you see all that and and particularly around the sustainability piece. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And it's something that definitely we should all keep in mind. And honestly, it's very intentional in my videos to not necessarily talk about the foraging of native plants. Hey, we'll get back to the interview in just a moment. But first, I'm a big believer in using saunas to improve and maintain my health. In fact, I've had a clear light sauna in my home for almost 10 years now. And it's one of the ways I practice self-health care. I use it to detoxify myself from the industrial, chemical, and environmental pollution that's all around us and to keep my immune system supple and strong. It's relaxing, meditative, and an incredible way to ward off aches and pains, increase recovery speed, and can even help with weight loss too. Clearlight saunas utilize ultra-low EMF, full-spectrum infrared heaters. These saunas are easy to assemble yourself or with a friend, and they make a size for any home or apartment. They're also gorgeous, made from natural, eco-certified woods. Mine's cedar, and I absolutely love the way it looks and smells. My sauna is like a refuge for me. It's a quiet place where I can go to restore myself mentally and physically. But it's got modern tech too, including a Bluetooth-enabled sound system so I can listen to music or podcasts like this one, and chromotherapy lighting systems that allow me to customize my healing experience. After 10 years, I can personally attest to the quality, ease of use, and the benefits of Clearlight Saunas. In a world where self-health care is becoming more and more important, saunas are becoming less of a luxury and more of a health investment. To learn more about Clearlight Saunas, go to HealWithHeat.com and use the coupon code WILDFED. It'll get you $500 off your order, or you can use it to get an additional $100 off any of their sale prices. Again, it's HealWithHeat.com and the coupon code WILDFED gets you $500 off your order. Best of all, shipping's free inside the continental United States. Don't you think it's time you had a sauna at home? Check out Clearlight Saunas at HealWithHeat.com. Now, back to the show. If you go through all my videos, you'll see foraging for plants, but most of them are invasive plants or non-native plants. And I know it's a loaded term to use the word invasive, but in the way that eco ecologists use the term invasive in most people, I'm just going to keep it for this discussion. But I don't necessarily talk about the foraging of native plants because I feel like it would need more than just a 10 minute video to discuss how to sustainably harvest a plant. And I would feel like I'm just repeating myself over and over, but I think people need to hear it whenever going out and foraging things, especially plants uh, that are native and could be considered vulnerable or rare. So I do feel more comfortable teaching people about mushrooms because, I mean, as you know, and as probably 90% of your listeners know, it is akin to foraging fruits from a fruit tree or fruits from like a berry bush or something. You're literally harvesting the fruiting structures. And there have been long-term studies published showing that cutting or picking a mushroom literally has no discernible impact or difference on a species richness within the area or the number of fruiting bodies that fruit in a particular area. And one study that comes to mind was published in 2006 in the journal Biological Conservation. And this was conducted in Switzerland over 29 oh, years. Wow. And that was the conclusion of the study. Wow. Yeah, 29 years uh, in Switzerland. And they do have like what are considered to be bag limits in Switzerland. And so the researchers wanted to know if this was sound advice, you know, to put these restrictions on people who want to forage mushrooms. And that was the researchers' conclusion that foraging, either cutting or picking, had no discernible impact on species richness or number of fruiting bodies. But what did have a discernible impact was trampling. And so the other field plots where you didn't trample, they actually built catwalks so that you wouldn't disturb the mycelium. And so that's how they got around it. But in the plots where they did allow trampling, like walking through, kicking up the leaf litter, kicking up the duff, that actually that did have a negative impact on the area. That diminished the richness of species or diminished the amount of fruiting? It diminished the number of fruit bodies, but not the okay. species richness, wow. but the number of fruiting bodies. However, then there's another caveat. After that, they realized that it was only short term. Once they got up and moved, and let the forest kind of regenerate, everything came back to normal, wow. back to baseline and, you know, let's, let's And so the ultimate conclusion was just that, that it really doesn't have that much of an impact. But there's a couple other things I well, can say Well, I just think it, we ahead. should, for that, you know, I think it's probably closer to 95% of the listeners get it, um, what we're talking about. But for that 5% who don't, let's just clarify, <laughs> tell people sort of like what a mycelium is and what a fruit body is and whether, you know, that substrate is is forest litter or it's a tree, it's pretty similar, right? So kind of explain that for folks. Yeah, it's a good question. So whenever we talk about mushrooms, we're talking about fruiting structures or fruiting bodies that are produced by some 
fungal species. Not all, and in fact, not a lot, relatively speaking. So the fungal kingdom is incredibly large. Uh, estimates of up to 3 million species, 5 million, even more than that. And the standard number that's thrown out there is that maybe 5% have been identified to species <laughs> level. And a lot of them are actually, that's yeah, crazy. 5%. So we got a work cut out for us. And I honestly think that's why people are interested uh, in mushrooms I was going to well, say the same thing. I mean, Let, let's come back to that. Let's come back to well. that after because that's an important point. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, whenever you study fungi in, in the fungal kingdom, it is the study of microorganisms as well. I mean, we see the macroorganisms and people get excited about that. But a lot of fungal species are actually yeast microscopic. And, and so not, yeah, yeast and there's mold species, uh, there's rust fungi, I mean, spores and all that stuff. There's a lot of structures and just lifestyles that are completely microscopic. So not all fungi produce mushroom fruiting bodies. But the main vegetative network of a fungus, and it's kind of like the root network of a plant, but it's not essentially the same thing. It's called mycelium, and it's actually made up of little filaments called hyphae, and the singular is hypha, H-Y-P-H-A. So these little strands aggregate together and form a larger network called mycelium. And you can see this. I mean, you pick up a rock in the woods or flip over a log, and you just see these cottony strands like in the soil. white cotton candy. Or you go out in your garden... Yeah, exactly. And most of it's white, but there are other colors as well. And that's the majority of the fungal organism. And so it's largely unseen unless you go out of your way to actually see it. So it can be in the soil. It could be in a log. It could be in a tree. It could be in your body. It could be in an animal's body. It could be in all these different yeah, It could be under your toenail. And yeah, for sure. I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's all around. And the purpose of mycelia, uh, yeah, the purpose of mycelia to a large degree is to eat. I mean, that's what's doing the eating. So it's the vegetative uh, eating network of a fungus, and so it secretes enzymes outside of itself, digests things externally, and then absorbs it back into its tissues. And then, when the conditions are appropriate, some of these mycelial fungi will create reproductive structures that resemble. Wait, let, let me let me back you up there for so a second. The so let's say that we're talking about a, a mycelia that's um, infected a tree. So you're saying that it's going to excrete mm -hmm. an enzyme and let, that enzyme might break down lignin or it might break down cellulose or whatever it is that whatever component of the tree that the mycelium is eating, but it excretes them that digests things externally and then resorbs that into itself. That's very yeah, cool. Correct. Man. So it does it outside of itself. Cool. It is cool. I mean, that's one of the things that characterizes the fungal kingdom because for a long time, people thought fungi were plants. And uh, it wasn't until the 1960s when they were actually designated as their own kingdom. But one of the features that did designate fungi as true fungi was that they have external digestion. Uh, then they absorb the nutrients okay, into their so tissues. That's part of how we classify them. Yeah, it's incredibly bizarre, but that's just the way it is, I guess, with them. They figured out a way to do that, and they do it and really, really well. And then they punch well. those fruit bodies either through the tree or, or through the ground. I always think of them as like, I always imagine it's a periscope and that the mycelia is like a submarine, you know? Yeah. But then that fruit body comes up. So somebody, as you said before, somebody comes along and they harvest that mushroom. It's sort of like you've taken the apple off the tree. Um. Whereas Correct. the organism itself is still either underground or in the tree or whatever its substrate is. So it's largely unaffected. But then you're saying actually the walking on top of it um, can probably damage some of that hyphae? Yeah, that was part of the uh, conclusion that the researchers discovered was that it can negatively impact it. But it seems that it was only yeah. short term, that once the people left. But What's going on today is in short term. I mean, right. people are out there constantly, more and more people these days. And so I don't know if these areas would ever get a break in the near future. And so we don't know what the repercussions would be after 29 mm -hmm. years, because I think the longest study to date has only been 29 years, even though it's a pretty long time. But of course, there are other repercussions as well. I mean, fungi just don't exist to satisfy themselves. I was I mean, just other say, organisms their rely on them. For, and so, and food for a lot of creatures. For sure. Yeah, and so we don't have studies on the impacts of fungal harvesting on the insect population, you know, like on flies or maggots or beetle that consume mm -hmm. these organisms or the mammals that consume them. And then it goes up the food chain, you know, to the birds mm -hmm. or the other predators that consume all of them. And so, I mean, it seems that it's relatively safe to harvest a lot of mushrooms. But, I mean, if you want to get like on a deeper level, more spiritual level, it's like you wouldn't go to your neighbor's apple tree and just pick every single apple without like saying thank you or giving a gift in return or just expressing gratitude. 
Uh, and so why should we approach right. the foraging of mushrooms any well, differently? Yeah, and, also, and just go out there with no intention And obviously whatsoever. they are uh, releasing spore into the environment. So to me, it seems like, you know, allowing some of them to do that is wise. Um, and I think too, we talked before about when people harvest mushrooms that are passed because they're just so excited to have found the mushroom. And I watch, particularly with your classic sort of toad, toadstool shaped mushroom, that as that umbrella shaped cap uh, matures, it starts to peel upward and fold upward and just mm -hmm. all those last spores are like sort of wrung out of it, you know? So when I see one like that, I think mm -hmm. like, well, that's a, it's kind of like when I catch a fish that's just filled with eggs, you know, you're like, this one's a producer, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it seems good to me oh, to yeah. allow um, mushrooms to go through their life cycle, you know, and then just harvest the ones that make sense to you, you know, taking a small percentage or whatever. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's just a lot that's unknown right now, but generally speaking, it seems like it's okay right. to harvest that's plenty awesome. of mushrooms. And I belong to a mushroom club with, which has close to a thousand members and we tend to hit up the same spots year after year. And these spots just mm -hmm. seem to be as prolific as they were 10 years ago. And so just me noticing this stuff, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that bad. I mean, at least compared to like ecological destruction, habitat loss, <laughs> right, what industry is doing right, and all right. of that. It's like, I really don't think foragers are adding too much to that burden. Right. To a small degree they are, but I think they're just bigger obstacles well, in the sometimes way. Sometimes I can't, it's funny because you'll get more criticism sometimes from people who are more aligned with you than if you were like McDonald's. You yeah, know? you're absolutely saw, right. I don't know what all I that's about. I saw a woman the other day, just a little anecdote. She had posted, I was just happened to be tagged in the post. She had been, she was, she's into rewilding as a concept and somebody had taken her to go fishing for the first time she caught ra uh, rainbow trout. And she was just posting a very humble post about how good it felt to get a meal off the landscape without having to, um, you know, shop for it and how this is her first time and just the process of actually catching the fish and killing the fish and cooking it. And I mean, it's just this beautiful post of a person kind of gushing about this experience they'd had in nature. And the very first comment was a person being like, you need to check your privilege. Not everyone can go fishing there. Are, most people are dealing with polluted waterways. And it's just like, what would make you want to say that to somebody? I couldn't really, you know, like there are trawlers out there who are just pulling up like tens of thousands of pounds of bycatch and just letting it die on the, on the, you mm -hmm. know, on the boat. And this is like what you want to say to this person. It's just like really strange to me. So uh, that's one of the things when you forage is you inevitably get the people who have some like weird negative message for you, you know, but um, I think ultimately, you know, yeah, I mean, stay away from the YouTube comment yeah, section. That's right. all I have to tell you. I mean, I know you've got videos on there, but it's like it, it'll make you so depressed to read some of those comments that people say about you, even though you put out like this beautiful 20-minute mm -hmm. video, ad-free and all this stuff. And it's like, really? That's what you have to say yeah. about that? Um, yeah, but, but then, yeah, then you know, my the wife's always today. like, babe, think about who these people are who are – because I'm not, I'm not like know. somebody who's <laughs> commenting on YouTube videos. <laughs> if I watch a YouTube video, yeah, I know. It's like, I'm uh, just like grateful yeah. I got the video. If I don't like it, I just change it. But I'm not on there like writing Exactly. Stuff, you know? It's like it's so easy. <laughs> so it should be like You're think about who right. that is. And then it's like, oh, yeah. Like it would be yeah. cool sometimes to be able to like see the person. And then because I think like sometimes you read something, and you're like, ouch. And then if you could see the person and what they're going through, you'd be like, oh, man, I actually feel bad for them. But uh, anyway, side note. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But I think right. uh, going back to what you were saying before about how there's a sort of very Indiana Jones-like sense of discovery in the mushroom world. Like you could you could get into the, the mushroom world even as an amateur and discover something, <laughs> you know? And Yeah, I mean, in your backyard, you could discover a new species probably today. It's just a really wild idea. Pro like right? literally probably today. You cannot do that with an yeah. animal. Or plants, right? Like, I mean... When's the last time your friend discovered a new yeah. animal? Exactly. Or uh, yeah, you're right with plants as well. But with mushrooms, yeah, it's a lot of undiscovered stuff, a lot of new things that even resist classification and right. detection as right. well. So as much as we want to find these things, it's probably never going to happen in our lifetime. Yeah, and then you also have a many instances of a lack of a common name, which is also pretty interesting because yeah. again, like um, if I say white-tailed deer, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You know, I don't have to go to the species, uh, like name for you to know what I'm talking about. It's like, we have a common name for every animal. It's just that it's that simple. Mm -hmm. But when we start getting into some of the obscure mushrooms, it's like the, the, the Latin binomial starts to become important because we don't have another way 
of referring to some of these species. At least that's what I experienced, particularly when I was out with a uh, with Alan Burgo, uh, as you were mentioning. Like um, he just, you know, he's pretty deep in it, and he's running around like a kid on an Easter egg hunt. And shouting out Latin all over the place, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I just have like a handful of mushrooms that I know. So I'm not like that. I'm not in that discovery phase with it the way he is. Uh, but it was just interesting to me to note that um, there was a lot that he he couldn't just tell me like, oh, yeah, this is called a, you know, because like there's mushrooms like that's a giant puff ball. It's like very easy, yeah. you know, generic name. But uh, but a lot of the species he was into, they didn't have that. So. Yeah, more so than any other discipline. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you go out with birders, nobody's spitting out a Latin name of a bird. Right. I mean, same thing with animals, like you said. With plants, to some degree, you do see it, especially if you're just out there botanizing. But with mushrooms, it's almost expected that you give a scientific Latin mm -hmm. binomial rather than the common name. And uh, I don't know if you have that field guide, the Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Mushrooms by Gary Linkoff. But that was like the classic book that was out for a long time. And it's still a, a bestseller today. And I do recommend it for beginners. Uh, but the author and editor, Gary Linkoff, tells the story that before that went out to publishing, he only had scientific names for every mushroom. And they said, you have to make up common names for these mushrooms. Or we're not going to publish it. So he stayed up with his friends the night before they <laughs> Eating sent it out. Mushrooms. Just literally made up the name. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, probably. And they made up the names for the mushrooms. And those are the ones that we use today. He says, because I met him and I talked to him, he's like, yeah, I made up half of those names. And that's what we're calling them today. Just right. because he made them Oh, up. just a public, because a publisher said they wouldn't publish others. Yep. You know, back to, um, there's always like uh, what you see on the surface and then, you know, the hidden realm of, of what's going on in any culture. And um, one of the things that I also notice is that because there is a very well-known um, entheogenic, you know, group of mushrooms, or actually multiple groups, um, mushrooms that give you a psychedelic experience if you ingest them, it seems to me that there are a lot of people in the mushroom world who've had that experience. Like, for instance, with botany, the average botanist I know has not had a psychedelic experience with plants, even though mm -hmm. they study plants and even though there are just countless species of plants that can provide that kind of experience, whether it's through, uh, I don't know, mescaline or whether it's through uh, dimethyltryptamine or, you know, any kind of whatever it is that, that you're using, you know, a plant for, they got all this psychedelic plant medicine and botanists mm -hmm. tend not to dip their toes into that. But I have found, and I'm just curious if you find this because you're part of a mushroom group, so you have a larger sample size than me. Do you find that the psychedelic realm of mushrooms is, if not indulged in, at least well understood and talked about within the world of like amateur mushroom people and professionals? 100%. 100%. 100%. You're absolutely right. I mean, I never thought about it too much, but now that you bring it up, yeah. And Honestly, early on when I got into this, I was actually surprised to learn that some of these people partook in those medicines. I thought, oh, there's no way that yeah, person they seem too they all. seem too straight or whatever, but then For sure. And then I think, wait a minute, they must have not had a lot because I would know <laughs> if they had that kind of experience. They just don't seem like the kind of person like that had that experience. People. But okay, maybe they're just like dabbling in it, you know? I'll 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 know for sure whenever they've had, you know, that kind of dose. But yeah, I mean, you go to these forays and I'm not gonna name any names, but some of them are just geared towards the culture yeah. of psychedelic right. and hallucinogenic substances. And uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. I, I have found that to be true more so because I do go between both communities, the plants and the mushrooms, and hardly anybody talks about those things, the entheogenic substances. In, in botany. Botanizing. Right? Yeah, in botany, you it's, botanize. almost, it's just doesn't come up. And, you know, less so, but let's say in the animal world too, like, um, you know, the bufo, I don't know if you ever um, used mm -hmm. DMT from a bufo toad. I don't know if there's something you want to talk about publicly or not, but. Oh, I, I have not. Okay. No. I have actually caught. <laughs> it's not something that I'm opposed to. Or okay. Anything. So I've caught those toads in the desert and extracted their, uh, their glandular secretions and, you know, imbibed that with folks. And I mean, it's just an outrageous, it's a truly outrageous, maybe one of the most outrageous experiences you can have, uh, particularly coming out of the natural world. It's quite shocking. Um, the DMT high, but it's not mm -hmm. like people who hunt or even let, that's too, too broad. Let's say, I imagine when you get into the world of herpetology, you know, people who are into amphibians and reptiles, like, I don't think that probably comes up that much, but you get into the world of mushrooms and it seems like everybody knows about it and everybody's done it. And even some of the big names, I remember like 
reading Paul Stamets books when I was younger and being like, oh, this guy's all into the science. And then, and then seeing stuff from him where I'm like, oh, he partakes, you know, that kind of thing. So it's quite surprising. I just think, and that experience with mushrooms, with psychedelic mushrooms, I feel like can really, of all, really deepens a person's relationship to the natural world. And for me personally, I'll just speak from experience, but it's like, it's made me see mushrooms as almost like um, a technology, like this intelligence on the planet, you know? There's so much lore around mushrooms too, like this idea of mushrooms being sort of, you know, I, people always like to talk about them being from outer space or how far their spores mm -hmm. can get off the surface of the earth or the sort of, you know, there's just this interesting lore around mushrooms that you don't, again, just you don't have around plants and animals so much, you know? Yeah, it it just came to mind right now when you're talking about how you don't see it with like herpetologists or botanists talking about these kinds of things. But I almost wonder if it has also something to do partly with in mycology, more so than any other like natural science, you see a large influence amongst the amateur people, like the amateur mycologists who aren't yep, professionals, yep. but they drive the science so much because they're out there in the field studying these things. They're finding things. They're talking about the diversity. They're finding new species. And so they have an influence on the professional discipline. Like a tremendous influence. Not a tremendous one. Yeah. I mean, I know that's true to some degree with plants and animals and all that stuff. Less, but less. Less. And I mean, I've met professional mycologists who don't know wild species at all. And so they rely on just amateurs like me who go out there and find this stuff. And I've met people who know every single wild species that's out there, but they don't know much about the ecology of mushrooms or they don't know how to cultivate or they don't know the biology of it. So I think because you're seeing this crossover between the amateurs and not saying like, oh, all the amateurs are doing the drugs and all that stuff. They're bringing it into <laughs> no, the you. professional field. Not that, but I, get you. I think because you see a blend of both worlds, maybe that has something to do with it as well. That is an interesting point. I had an episode recently um, with a lichenologist, uh, but she- Yeah, I listened to that okay, one. That was good. That was really interesting, right? Because it's a similar thing in that- Well, you could hear, I'm sure, in that interview, my frustrations trying to understand what's a lichen. Where it's mm -hmm. like, well, it's a composite organism. So it's like, well, then how does it have a Latin binomial if it's actually two <laughs> organisms? And she's like, well, sometimes it's three organisms. It's like, wait, what? And then it's like one organism. And part of that, you know, relationship, symbiotic relationship is fungi. Uh, so it's just like partially the fungal kingdom. But anyway, my point in bringing it up was she was saying, you know, hey, a lot of the people in lichenology are amateurs and they are driving it as well. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so that's a really cool component because... I think, you know, I lamented as a child growing up that it felt like everything had been discovered and every place had been, you know, I had an, an adventurer spirit, but it was like, man, I felt disillusioned. Oh, the whole world's been figured out, you know, like the idea mm -hmm. that there was a time where the people of the Western hemisphere did not know that there was a, or sorry, that Eastern hemisphere, I guess, right? Is that right? The people of Europe had no idea that there was this, you know, two continents over here. And, mm -hmm. you know, they got over here and it was like, oh, the world's twice the size that we thought it was. But now that's like not going to happen again. <laughs> We're not going <laughs> to find another continent, you know, not at least not one on the surface. So I don't, you know, the idea that there's these fields like mushrooms where you can still discover and then on top of it that you can get food and medicine from it. Mm -hmm. It's just really fascinating. Um, curious, man, where you see things headed uh, with wild foods and with the culture and community. And, you know, one of the things that I've brought up a, a lot on this show is concerns I have about how many people were, the more people like you and people like me, people like Arthur, people like Sam, people like Alan, the more excited we get people about wild food, the more people there are on the landscape, the more people there mm -hmm. are on the landscape, especially harvesting, um, the more impact we have. And, um, I'm, when I ask where it's headed, one of the couple things that I'm wondering about are where do you see it headed legally and uh, where do you see it headed ecologically? Do you think that all these folks coming on board are a net positive or are you concerned about net negatives? You seem like a very optimistic dude um, with a real <laughs> clean energy. I notice your vibe is like, you know, you, you've got a very positive, buoyant energy about you. So I don't see you as a pessimist, but um, just kind of, you know, curious, just like overall, everything I just said, the big picture, just stall. How do you, how do you see this thing moving forward in the next decade? I think about this a lot because I do realize that, I mean, I like to be out there by myself and not see a single person when I'm out there. 
foraging for mushrooms or looking for plants or trees. And a lot of it has to do with because I'm working out there. And so I don't want anybody ruining the shot. But I also right. realize that if I want to forage certain mushrooms in a particular area and I'm going to teach about it, then other people might figure out where that is and all that stuff. And people ask me all the time, where'd you shoot that video? Where'd you shoot that one? And I never tell anybody. Some people figure it out, but <laughs> yeah, and right. I've even What's given the combination to like, your safe anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. I mean, some of these places are just so sacred to me, and I, I realized that it took me a while to find this place. And yeah. if they're meant to be there, they'll figure it out too, or they'll find their own place. Like you will discover those areas, and there's so much joy in just finding new areas to forage and to explore. Um, so I do realize that the more I talk about this stuff, the more people are going to do it. And I see this with the mushroom club that I'm in because, you know, a couple of years ago, we only only had 500 members. But last year we had a thousand members. Wow. And there's a lot of people that are. Yeah. Just in Western Pennsylvania. hundred percent growth, in, dude. 100% yeah, it's insane. Growth in a year. Yeah, it was a couple of years. OK, a wow. couple of years. That's but staggering. I'd say within five years. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's only going to increase, I mm -hmm. believe. But I also do see the beginnings of more restrictions being put in place. More and more people are getting interested in commercial foraging of mushrooms here in Pennsylvania. Now, commercial foraging isn't really a big thing in Pennsylvania. Uh, we do have some restrictions in the state parks and the national forests that we have, uh, but it's largely about plants. But now we're starting to see you need a certification if you're going to forage mushrooms commercially. And if you're going to do it in a particular public area like a state park or a national forest, you need permission before you do something like that. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I mean, I like having the freedom of going out and foraging mushrooms and nobody telling me you can't forage that. But I also understand the impact that I can have on the ecology. And the, um, and the so idea I, of the tragedy that commons, which is you're like, well, I'm only taking sure. these, but then so is 40 other people, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and one thing that's missing with this whole wild food culture today, I think, is a serious discussion on sustainability uh, and sustainable foraging and how we can best do that. And a lot of people dismiss it quickly, especially when you talk about mushrooms. Uh, if you talk about this like in a Facebook group or even amongst friends, I mean, a lot of people just dismiss it because of those findings that I mentioned before. So it almost just like doesn't make sense why you would talk about such a thing. But you have to look down the line a little bit. I mean, 15 years from now, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years from now, I mean, I'm sure that the people who took some white pine trees in the 1800s from Pennsylvania figured mm -hmm. that, yeah, nothing's going to happen. You know, there's so many of them. There's just so many pine trees, so many hemlock trees, so many oak trees. We could never. How could, how could we ever deplete it. the sperm whales? The, yeah, <laughs> the ocean's exactly. full of them. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, you just got to look forward a little bit and understand that everything that we do, it doesn't matter what it is, everything, every thought you have, everything you say, everything you don't say, everything you don't think has an impact. There's a consequence associated with everything. And I think the age that we live in right now, honestly, will be characterized by being untethered to consequences, thinking that you're untethered to consequences, thinking that no matter what you do, there is no consequence to it. Everything, everything that we buy from a grocery store, nobody even thinks about, like, where did that come from? What's the cost really of that? And you hear it in the way people speak about foraging, like free food. It's free. No cost. Right, free. Right. You always hear that term free. And I'm thinking, but it wasn't free. There is a cost associated with it. You remove it. Could it. Even be a so higher, something. It could even be a higher cost than what you'd pay at the store in a sense. Yeah, Depending for sure. What we're talking about if you get up in Maine and you start messing with ginseng up here, for instance, you might be having a bigger impact than if you went to McDonald's and bought a burger as far as like what kind of ecological impact you're actually talking about. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, I mean, I just encourage people to be intentional whenever you're out there foraging. And obviously, don't treat it like a grocery store or anything like that, but get to know each organism individually whenever you forage it. Get to know its status. Maybe it's rare, maybe it's threatened, maybe it's vulnerable, maybe it's not. And what's interesting is that there actually is a list of threatened fungal species around the world. And we don't really hear about this too much. You hear about it with plants, you hear about it with animals, but you don't necessarily hear about it with mushrooms. But there is a list and it's called the IUCN Red List of Fungi. It's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Red List. And it's a list of fungi that have been analyzed for their global rank, whether it's secure or threatened or vulnerable or rare. And you can look at this list and you can see, hey, maybe these mushrooms aren't as common as we thought they were, or maybe they're actually on the decline and maybe we should reconsider foraging these. And interestingly, some mushrooms that we're very familiar with are on this list, including lion's mane, but it's not on the list here in North America, but in some countries in Europe, it's considered to be on the decline. 
And so, I mean, that might be something worth considering before going out there. I mean, I, largely I, I'm optimistic though, whenever it comes to all this stuff. Like I said earlier, I don't think that foragers are the main issue out there today. There's so many bigger issues out there, so many. And because we spend so much time in this world of foraging, it can be easy to think that we have such a massive impact. We do have an impact for sure, but I think there are bigger fights out there that are worth our time. Yeah, especially like not worth probably criticizing each other on Instagram over it. Um, but yeah. that said, I mean, there's a lot to pick apart there. Um, I want to make sure we come back to the IUCN, um, but I w- want to first say, and I mean, I, I know I've been beating this horse on this podcast for a while, so I apologize in advance for repetition, but but I, one of the things I've been wanting to point out is that a lot of the depletion of organisms in the past were not necessarily driven by the individuals who are harvesting them, but by the individuals who are paying a bounty for them. So it's very easy to point at the bison hunter, but not look at who was actually consuming the pelts. It's very easy to look at the beaver trappers who, who just, I mean, decimated the beaver population and therefore the, the tremendous engineering that the beavers had done to this landscape of North America it's really easy to look at the trappers and not look at the people, cons- you know, wearing the beaver hats. And now we're at this point where I don't think, when it comes to the commercial foraging piece you brought up before, the driver is not going to come from people who are interested in mycelia. I mean, sorry, in uh, mycology. The it's being driven by the food industry, right? So the more mm-hmm. people watch a chef's table, and the more they watch you know, the mind of a chef and they see these dishes and they get into hot cuisine. And then before you know it, you are demanding these mushrooms and that's what's sending the commercial foragers out to gather those. And then once the commercial forager has a dollar sign in their eye for over a species, we know how that goes. It's very hard to, if I bring you out into a a field and there's just hundred dollar bills on the ground and I go, Oh, just take a couple. (laughs) <laughs> it's like good, good yeah. luck, right? Like, oh, there's a bag limit. Good, mm-hmm. you know what I mean. That's hard to really enforce that stuff. So, I do think that uh, it's easy to see the forager because they're the one out there picking it, but not mm-hmm. see that it's actually the demand of the person who would never go into the field mm-hmm. at the restaurant that's driving that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in response to what you said is that one of the challenges we face as foragers is the complexity. It's a lot easier to regulate hunting and fishing. You only have a handful of species that you're allowed to harvest in any given state. And then, you know, you can make very simple rules. But when you start getting into the cornucopia of mushrooms and plants that we forage, it's very hard to regulate. And every one would require its own regulation because they're ecologically so different. And then the last thing I want to say in response is, unfortunately, like one thing I love is that if you go to Wikipedia, which I know people like to make fun of as a resource, but I, I personally find it very useful. And, um, as a starting point when I'm trying to learn about something new. And when you look at any organism on, um, Wikipedia, there is usually an IUCN, um, ranking. So you can see whether or not that's a, you know, a threatened species, an endangered species, um, a species of least concern. In other words, it's doing great. Uh, so I like that that's there, but I will say, and I, I doubt it's this way with mushrooms, but it certainly is with some animals where the IUCN's making decisions that are more political than they are ecological, uh, as you get into certain species. And so that adds this other layer of complexity where you have to ask yourself, like, is this thing really threatened or is the perception of it being threatened useful for certain environmental groups and the regulations they're pushing too. So it gets, it's so complex. And so I have spent a lot of time thinking about how can I help? I do agree. Uh, I think you said a moment ago, let me, I don't want to quote you here, but you said something about um, you kind of embrace the idea of there being regulations. Did, did, did you say that on mushrooming? Yeah. I mean, I see the merit in it. I don't know if right. I'm like a full supporter of it. Clearly I'd have to see what they're trying to regulate and how, oh, of course, but, of course. but the I idea of bringing the regulation. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like I would not want to see the regulations for hunting and fishing go away. It would just mm-hmm. be like nothing left on the landscape in a week. Mm-hmm. And I would be part of that. I would be part of that. If they said, Hey, there's no more regulations on turkeys, do what you will. I'd mm, we'll probably be eating turkey every night. So, uh, it's good to me that these things exist and that there is licensing because it funds the biological research. And so Mm -hmm. I think that it would be amazing to have that 
for mushrooms and plants. And when I think about how to effectively create that, boy, it gets overwhelming. You know what I mean? So oh, yeah. any, uh, any thoughts on that? Because it's not like, you know, you, you just can't say, if I give you the my guidelines for fiddlehead conservation for ostrich fern fiddleheads, that doesn't apply to any other plant. Mm-hmm. So you'd have to come up with specific for every species needs its own its own conservation ethic, right? It's not like yeah, I mean, uh, it's like you can't just, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's not like there are regulations on harvesting animals for the year. Like you can only harvest for animals. Like, what do you mean for animals? What animals? When you know? Right. So right. whenever we right. talk about when, mushrooms, right. I mean, it's an incredibly large kingdom. What do you mean mushrooms? It's the same whenever people generalize about like the health benefits of mushrooms. It's like saying the health benefits of plants or the health benefits of animals. It's like so (laughs) general. Like, what do you mean? Which one? What are you talking about? Uh, Yeah, I don't know. But that's how regulation tends to work, right? Regulation tends to be a very, it's a big broadsword, you Mm -hmm. know, because it's hard to get to the scalpel level of resolution on some of these things. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how it would be done because there are just so many species out there and there's just so many roles that they play as well. Um, because there are some that, you know, some are mycorrhizal and some are saprotrophic and some are parasitic. And let's go back. Myco, mycorrhizal, they have a relationship with the roots of plants. Yeah, um, correct. Saprophytic, they eat wood, right? I want to make sure people know what you're talking about. Yeah. So the mycorrhizal species are the ones that typically form those mutualistic symbioses with plants. And it's reported that over 90% of land plants have a mycorrhizal partner. Now, not all of them produce the uh, fruiting bodies that we see. A lot of them are microscopic, but incredibly important out there. But the saprotrophic ones, which are the ones that grow on a dead substrate and they break it down, those are incredibly important as well, or else we'd be walking around just on it, dead yeah, trees. dead trees, like piled up to the moon because nothing would ever be able to break down. But there are parasitic fungi as well that attack living substrates. And so if you would regulate mushrooms, well, would you do it first? species or would you do it by category yeah by category (laughs) yeah because maybe you'd want to remove some of these parasites but parasites also have an important ecological role because they're kind of the predators that keep species in check just gonna say like as soon as you start thinking that then you find out oh maybe there was something mutualistic we didn't see yeah Um, maybe like you said it's predatory and therefore it weeds out weaker specimens and that's important for that reason Or maybe there's a third or fourth order effect that doesn't have to do with the parasitized organism directly, but it has to do with one of the organisms that that parasitized organism was a predator on, and therefore it allows space for that other organism to thrive. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. it's so complicated that like silly regulations are not going to work, right? We need- Yeah, for sure. And the other thing is- I mean, we do see some regulations with mushrooms. Yeah. Like in the Pacific Northwest, you see them. There are some in Pennsylvania where I live. Largely on the commercial, largely a commercial, correct? Yeah. Largely commercial. Um, Even for personal though, I think in the Allegheny National Forest, which is our only national forest in the state, I think it's up to two gallons, but don't quote me on that for personal consumption per day of mushrooms. So you wouldn't want to be caught with three or four gallons, you know, or like backing up your pickup truck and just loading it with all these mushrooms. So we already (laughs) do see some regulations and people seem to be okay with it. But Unlike, I mean, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody or generalize too much, but so many people break the rules with mushroom foraging. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's always true with animals because it's harder to like sneak out of the it's, woods. With, dude, like, you deer. have wardens, right? You have Correct. wardens. Yep. We, we actually, I believe that, I believe that Maine is no longer participating in the show Northwoods Law. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, don't, again, this is like, don't quote me, but as I remember it, that's like a drama, what do you call that? Like a reality show mm. about um, wardens in Maine. But I think they're in New Hampshire now because Maine was like, look, this is not helping our states. Depends very heavily on hunters coming from out of state. And we don't want to give this impression that they're constantly, you know, people out there trying to bust you on everything. But the reality is like a warden's usually watching you through binoculars committing a crime mm-hmm. before he comes over and asks you about it. And then when you lie, it's like, well, I already actually saw you. And then they have tremendous jurisdiction. So even though we don't encounter them that often, we know they're there and that, you know, if you were, let, let's say you you shot a deer illegally in Maine. It's not just that they take the deer and fine you and you lose your license. It's like if you transported that deer in your truck, they're taking your truck. Mm -hmm. They're taking your gun. Like it's really serious. But I can't imagine. I don't know if there's mushroom wardens, but I just can't imagine it being that serious at this point. No, I mean, it's like pretty much a slap on the wrist right now. If even that, I mean. A lot of honor system probably. Yeah, I mean, 
it's illegal to pick mushrooms in a city park around here, even a community park and many of our community parks. But you see so many people out there doing it. You wouldn't see the same right. thing with hunting. Like if there's a place that was right, posted, exactly. you, you were shooting squirrels around. in your, you start shooting squirrels in the park. Yeah. Somebody's so, I mean, come that's just them. another factor that plays into making it pretty difficult to right. regulate these things. Um, but I mean, I'll say this final thing about regulating mushrooms, if that would be a thing. I mean, I think at least one benefit would be there would be a psychological influence on people where they would almost perceive mushrooms to be more precious than they yeah, actually perceive are. Perceive value. Yeah, perceive, perceive value, value. And maybe they would even encourage the protection and conservation of it just because, oh, it is being protected in some way. Well, maybe we should mm -hmm. abide by that. So maybe more psychological than actually logical. I don't know. I worry about like um, at when the COVID story initially emerged and uh, I don't know if they're still the bat. Is the bat theory still the official theory? I don't know. But like, yeah, I don't uh, know. That, 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 sorry, not theory. the bat theory. I believe that coronavirus did come from a bat, but I don't believe it came from a bat at the Wuhan wet market. Mm. But uh, anyway, regardless, whatever. People I think it's when I want. turned off the news. <laughs> yeah, <March. laughs> exactly. But uh, but I remember initially there the when it was first circulating, the story was first circulating. There was this immediate response of this is from people eating wild animals. We mm. need to stop that practice. It's barbaric. And, you know, the other day I was um, asked to come, um, I want to make sure I come back to that point, but I, I was asked to come um, kill and butcher a goat for somebody. Uh, this person had had this goat for seven years. Uh, it was more of a pet than it wasn't really raised for meat. But after seven years, they decided they were going to put this goat down and they wanted to know, would I come help? And I kill a lot of animals and uh, the there's a sense for me of like a fairness in it because I'm a predator in the woods and or whatever landscape I'm on and that animal can tell that you know people say to me all the time they'll be like oh how hard can squirrel hunting be I walk right up to them all the time it's like well walk up to them in a low crouch with a weapon in your mm -hmm. hand and then <laughs> see what they perceive you know because they understand what you're doing so um to me I'm I'm I've never deceived this animal I'm in the woods to to harvest the animal. With the goat, I felt this tremendous difference because this animal, I'm petting it, I'm talking to it, I'm setting it at ease, and then I'm betraying it with a bullet. And I could see how it felt for the person who raised the goat because she felt also like there was this tremendous sort of betrayal going on because she had a personal relationship. I don't have a personal relationship with the animals I harvest. I have a species mm -hmm. relationship only. So uh, to me, I bring that up to say, going back to the wet market, I think of it as like quite, I think the like livestock husbandry can be pretty um, barbaric. It's like, no, we're friends. No, really, yeah. you can trust me. And then like one day you can't trust me. So um, that's not against agriculture or anything like that. But I just noticed there's a difference. When I hear that it's barbaric to eat wild animals, I'm like, oh, geez, I don't know. I think there's a pretty good argument on both sides mm -hmm. here. Uh, but anyway, right after the Wuhan story came out, there was, um, you know, China started to ban uh, the consumption of wild animals. And I, people started to talk about that. And I get worried about these like blanket, like no nuance blanket bans on things. Like I just get worried about that. And um, I, what we came very close in the state of Maine, I shouldn't say we came very close, but we had, um, we almost had this sort of law in effect in Maine where it was going to be illegal to harvest wild plants. Um, and unless you were on private land and had permission to be there. So a um, couple things coming up there I want to ask you about. Um, do you have any concerns about like, let's say that you have a high profile mushroom problem and then the state just goes, you know what, we're not allowing it anymore. Like, do you ever worry about that kind of thing? Um, that'd be the first question. The other question I have is what are your thoughts about private land and foraging? Because I think one of the really dirty secrets of foragers is that we are legally, technically and legally sometimes stealing plants from private landowners, mm -hmm. right? Like if I go you know, if, if you own 500 acres and you just don't patrol it and you don't fence it or mark it or whatever, and I end up on some of that and I bend over and pick a mushroom off of that, I'm technically stealing something from your property. And we don't talk about that very much, but I think we need to start addressing it because the future world is going to be so much more regulated. You know what I mean? And people oh, are going to yeah. be much more aware of their private land um, privileges or whatever. So yeah, thoughts on blanket bans and thoughts on private land. 
Yeah, I mean, I can't speak on every state or all around the world, but when it comes to, am I worried about them banning the foraging of mushrooms here in Pennsylvania? Not at all. Um, I don't think that's an issue yet. Like I said earlier, just commercial foraging or the over harvesting of things just doesn't seem to be a problem yet. But again, I do look to the future and it seems like it's becoming more popular. I still think we would have many, many years before they would allow or not allow us to go out and forage for mushrooms or anything like that. I mean, it's embedded in the codes with the state parks and the national forests about what's allowed and what's not allowed. And I don't think it's a big problem yet, even though I did kind of mention, you know, people do break the rules, but it does seem kind of innocuous because when people even forage for mushrooms, a lot of the time they're not even foraging for edible or medicinal species. A lot of people just want to know what things are. So they'll just pick whatever they see, like one of each thing. And I'm guilty of this as well. You know, like I don't always fill my basket with edible stuff. And so I figure if I'm going to get caught in a place where I shouldn't be with mushrooms, I'll just make the excuse, look, I'm just doing this for science because these things aren't even edible. <laughs> Half of these things are poisonous, you know, like they would kill me. You should let me just go with all of these. Um, so I'm not that worried yet about any of that. And then um, your second question about foraging on private land. Honestly, I don't do a lot of that on private land for mushrooms just because for mushrooms here in Pennsylvania, we are allowed on many public areas to forage for mushrooms. Um, so I don't have much experience going on a private property unless I would have permission to do so. And I mean, I do abide by the rules there. I mean, most of the time when I'm going out to a particular piece of land, I know where the boundaries are. And we're fortunate to live in an area that has so many wild spaces that do allow the foraging of mushrooms that there's really no need for me to go to some private property and just stumble upon it and start picking the mushrooms on there. I think that, uh, I am hearing what you're saying, but I think that that's probably a larger, it's a bigger issue than our community likes to talk about. You know, I live in a state where we don't have those same kind of trespassing laws. I mean, yeah. you can just go onto people's property, but I mean, it's really easy that you're, you're on public land right here. And then you take one step and you're not, and wow, there's morels right there. And it's like, how does that work? Mm. You know, like we don't talk about it. So I'm really, I just think that, uh, I like having these conversations with people because I think that a lot of this is we're we'll look back. Maybe it won't be in ten years. Maybe it'll be in a hundred years. We'll look back and this is the wild west of foraging going oh, on. Oh right yeah, now. yeah. I mean, you I, know, I see like, that too for sure. It's an interesting time. Um, tell me uh, what you're excited about, man, for the future, and what are you wanting to learn and get into? And also, am I ever going to get you out hunting and fishing? <laughs> well, I do hunt a little bit. Um, I hunt deer, venison, so. That's the only thing that I pretty much hunt animal wise these days. Uh, but I got into that about five years ago. So I am an adult onset hunter. I know you guys talked about that with Hank Shaw and who coined that term. Uh, I forget the guy's name, but that perfectly describes me. So I've been doing that uh, every winter season here in Pennsylvania. And I love it. I love going out there. It's a completely different ballgame. You got game. pretty generous, generous limits there, huh? In Pennsylvania. Yeah. I mean, you're allowed one antler deer and then a deer for every tag you can get for an antlerless deer. But fortunately where I live, since I live pretty close to a city, there are so many tags available for antlerless deer around here <laughs> and not that many people hunt. And so I'm you can, <laughs> yeah, you can get a lot Come of on. tags and you can kill a lot of deer and you can harvest them. And I mean, our city is overrun with deer. You go to our parks and you can just see the impact of too much deer on the land. Just the way the landscape looks you see them on the side of the road. It's just a, I know there's a lot of people. Like, Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people here as well. Um, but there are a lot of deer. And so fortunately, I mean, the laws are pretty amenable to you know us going out and harvesting a lot of food if you live in a particular Wait till area. deer populations grow in relationship to human populations and, and they, they yeah. thrive on the edge of our habitat that we use. So we tend to cause there to be more deer by nature of being alive, right? We just make deer habitat. So, yeah, for sure. Right? So. Yeah, I mean, whenever the deer were almost wiped out completely of uh, Pennsylvania, I think in the late 1800s, maybe, um, just because of uh, hunting and just unrestrained shooting of them and the market as well. The landscape, the way that it looked, you know, with all the shrubbery, they came back really easily because the forests were so new and there's so much food for them to dine on. Uh, and so I think our deer population is up to about 1.5 million yeah. and about maybe 300,000 are harvested every year. But the numbers are going up both yeah. number of deer harvested and the deer population. That's cool. uh, so I believe that the game commission is doing pretty well. I mean, you talk to some of these old timers and they'll tell you otherwise. And sometimes I don't always understand why they feel the way they do, but they've been in it a long time. And 
some of them are just really disgruntled and fed up with the way things are running around here. But I'm happy with that. It that's one of those things we don't food. have. Like, for instance, if they suddenly started making laws about mushrooming, um, significant sweeping laws and bag limits and all of that, like you and I might be talking to the younger generation and being like, oh, I remember a day when they didn't tell you what you had to do mm-hmm. and you could take this many. And ever since they made them laws, you never see any of the heresiums around anymore. And I think it's because, you know, like it, I think you get a lot yeah. of that going on. So, you know, because uh, generation, two generations ago is a very different landscape for as far as hunting and fishing oh, are concerned. Sure. And so uh, it's funny to hear because I get to talk to a lot of hunters and I get to talk to a lot of the scientific regulators and they are just not even, they're just talking past each other. Mm. It's pretty fascinating. So we don't deal with that as much. You know, we tend to have a more broad ecological view, I think, as mm. foragers, but we also haven't yeah. had to pick sides because of laws, you know, so it's we're a little bit freer. Oh, that, yeah. I think. Yeah, but I mean, I enjoy going out there uh, every winter for weeks at a time. And we have an extended season through January in some parts of Pennsylvania, fortunately, where I live as well. And I remember when I first got into it a couple of years ago, it was completely different from going out foraging for plants or mushrooms because you just, the way I hunt is I just stand still, Mm -hmm. like by a tree and just wait. I mean, I don't go out there and stalk. Usually, I've done that before successfully, but usually my style is to just wait. And it's different from foraging for mushrooms or plants or just walking through the woods because you're just standing still the whole time and you're letting the forest come alive and you're not disturbing it as much as you would if you do make a lot of noise going through there. And so it completely changed the way that I walk into a forest today because I'm quieter now, even if I'm looking for plants or mushrooms or trees or anything, I just approach it differently. Mm -hmm. And I noticed it the first year after I was done hunting and I cleaned out my gun and the season was over, the next time I took a step into the woods, I just noticed I wanted to do it more quietly. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be a little more calm about it. And I noticed with the guys that I hunt with, because I hunt with some older people, they're the ones that taught me how to do it. They approach it in that way. But the people who don't hunt, generally, I'm just speaking generally now, or the people who just passively walk through the ecosystem, just hiking, they tend to be loud. They'll step on things. They'll be talking super loud. And it's like, oh, but you're missing out. You're missing so much of what's going on out here. All the animals are running from you. And if you would just slow down a little bit. And I can't say I always approach it that way because sometimes like I only got half an hour to get something. So I'm going to run through there and grab it and get out of there. But usually I'm a little more cognizant of my approach in the wild. It all has to do with hunting. I'm just being quieter, being more still and letting the forest kind of do its thing and hoping that it doesn't notice that I'm there. I love that. But it's been fun. I really enjoy I it. I love that you're saying that because I, I was thinking about it actually earlier because you were saying how, you were talking about the challenges of um, capturing, you know, videography or photography of plants and mushrooms versus animals and how it's more challenging. And and for until I started hunting, I didn't really see a lot of animals in the woods. And I didn't realize it was because I was being obnoxious in the woods. And so... You know what I mean? Just even though I was there to forage and I was there to gather, I, you know, talking to people, making noise, moving around a lot, blah, 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 blah. I just, until you intentionally go into the woods, I think, and that colors people's impression of how much wildlife there is, right? So particularly, I think people who are just purely recreating, like hiking, for instance, tends to be that you're, you're, making a lot of loud footfalls in a really steady rhythm, talking to the person walking next to you, wearing fluorescent orange, you know, all that stuff. And so you just don't realize there's, there is wildlife there. There are bears there. There are deer there. There, you know, you're just not seeing them. So that's, I really like that you brought that up. Cause I think that somebody could forage their whole life and not necessarily encounter nearly as much wildlife for sure. You'll encounter wildlife, but not nearly as much as you would um, if you went into the woods the way you would when you hunt. So a uh, cool point. What do you, what do you have? Uh, what's on your horizon? What are you getting excited about? So lately I've been focusing on trees a lot and I know a lot of my content doesn't reflect that, but I've been working on this uh, tree project for the past year and it's probably going to take another two years to complete it, but I'm documenting uh, native trees of Eastern North America, largely Northeastern North America into the Appalachian region Uh, learning them, documenting them, and filming them. And then I'm going to put that into a project that I'll probably release in 2022. It's going to take some time, but I'm having a lot of fun with it because I'm seeing the forest differently now Mm. that I'm looking at trees. And honestly, that's why I've been noticing birds more. Like, I don't know if you look through some of my content, but if you would scroll back a year, no birds whatsoever. 
But in the past couple of months, you're seeing a couple birds and then that video that I put out there on the Pileated Woodpeckers, all because I'm paying attention to the trees now and I'm starting to look at them differently and noticing when they're flowering or when they're fruiting or why certain ones fruit in a particular area or don't fruit in a particular area or what they're associated with. Is it like a wetland area? Is it more dry? All these different things. And one of the benefits of that is that I'm noticing the birds now and other wildlife as well. Uh, so I'm putting this project together. I'm not going to say too much about it because there's going to be an element of surprise associated with it. But that's where my work is kind of heading right now. Um, clearly, I'm still putting out the videos on YouTube and doing live events as well. But uh, the trees are keeping me pretty occupied and busy. And one reason I really like that is because the mushroom season, at least here in Pennsylvania this year, isn't that great because it's been dry. so dry yeah. and so hot. And I can't tell you how many times people say, yeah, I was out today. Didn't see anything. Yeah. Man, I saw nothing. Got skunked. It's like, yeah, but you didn't see like the flowering rose bush, or you didn't see like the wood frogs, or you didn't see that salamander, or you didn't see the birds. You, like you saw nothing really. Hard <laughs> to believe. But for some reason, when people go out with that particular goal, specifically with mushrooms, it's easy to be so discouraged. And yeah. I couldn't imagine if I just focused on mushrooms this year, how disappointed I would be. But I mean, the trees don't mind the dry weather. And if anything else, it's been such a benefit to them. They, they've been flowering like crazy this year. It's just been so beautiful to observe them. Uh, so I got really lucky timing this project the way that I did. Um, so that's what I'm working on these days. That's cool, man. I It's interesting with certain trees, like, you know, if I see the dogwoods, you know, in the early spring, it's like their flowers are really apparent and they really catch your eye. But there are flowers, like here where I live, a lot of the landscape's dominated by red maple. And in the spring when they flower, if you have the eyes to see it, it's almost like fall in that the whole mm. canopy has no tree, there's no leaves yet. So without that foliage, you can just look out and see this bright, like maroon red haze through the forest mm -hmm. of those flowers. And it's quite beautiful, but most people never see it. It's like they're oh, not yeah, trying you're to absolutely see that. Right. Um, and so there's these things that plant that trees are doing. And then the other thing is, as a forager, I have the, these food relationships with trees. Cause it's like maple. I, I make maple syrup and the birches, I make birch syrup from a couple species. Um, and then, you know, the oaks, I live off the acorns as do most of the things that I hunt. And so you, I've been noticing that trees are this really crucial food resource for me, mm -hmm. um, in a way, the basswood leaves, you know, uh, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and I think that they get overlooked a little bit by foragers. So that part's really cool. And then I have more patience for people not knowing plants around them, but I feel like trees are this really good place for people to start learning. Mm -hmm. They're so big and easy to pick out. And once you know them, you know, it's cool how you can look at a hillside 10 miles away and kind of tell what trees are there. Do you know what I mean by that? Like you can, yeah, from a absolutely. distance, like, and so I feel like tree identification is a really good place for people to start. And I just don't think there's a lot of excuses for not learning some of the trees on your landscape in your lifetime. You know, I don't mean to put any pressure on people, but it's like, <laughs> they're pretty easy to learn, you know, at least, um, the genuses, you know, around you and stuff like that. So what, what trees are you, you really excited about? I mean, all of them. I'm trying to capture all the native ones, at least around here. Uh, some of the more rarer ones in Pennsylvania that I'm probably going to head to a bog to see, because we don't have a lot of like boggy wetland areas in Pennsylvania, just because of the geology and the way the glaciers did their damage to the landscape uh, thousands of years ago. Um, but black spruce and red spruce and balsam fir and uh, tamarack are the ones that I've got my eye on these days, just because they're not that common in Pennsylvania. Uh, so, I mean, this project also gets me into areas that I would never explore. Like, I would never have a reason to go looking in these areas for anything else. Um, like, I was down in West Virginia the other day looking for a sourwood tree, which is a tree in the Heath family. So, the flowers kind of look like uh, blueberries. And it was just fun being down there trying to find this tree. Even though I wasn't going to eat it, I still found this tree. But when I was down there, I did find blueberries and I did find milkweed. And I found all these mm -hmm. other plants that, like, right. I could eat. And I would have never gotten into that area or known that place is actually a repository for wild foods, all because of a sourwood tree that brought me down there. Yeah. And I almost didn't think I was going to find it. But like at the last minute, I just made a turn on a road and just happened to see it just like glistening in the sunlight, like you said, with those flowers just like blossoming. But this is a tree that flowers later, clearly later in the year, because it's uh, mid-July 
it's probably one of the last ones to flower. But it's interesting because some trees just flower early, like in March or April. Uh, but yeah, any native tree I'm game for. So I'm trying That's to get That's cool, all. man. Tell people about, uh, again, just like sort of how to f- access all your stuff and about the program that you have uh, online as well as your upcoming um, event. Yeah. So if you want to learn more about like the stuff that I do, you could head on over to learnyourland.com. Uh, pretty much everything can be found there. But nowadays, you know, a lot of people just go strictly to a social media site. So you'll, you'll probably find me most active on YouTube and then second, probably Instagram or Facebook. And a lot of people think it's called Know Your Land or Learn About Your Land, but it's learnyourland.com. Or you can just search my name, which is Adam Harriton. And yeah, I have an online mushroom foraging course. So this is a heavily curated uh, course that takes you through all of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, and takes you from an absolute beginner level to a proficient level where you can harvest at least 50 species of wild mushrooms. And you learn how to cook them, how to prepare them, how to harvest you learn about medicinal mushrooms, you learn about toxic fungi, fungal ecology. So it's geared for the beginner, but even people who are, you know, intermediate level would still learn something from that. And um, yeah, that's how you can learn more about the stuff that I do. And unfortunately, the workshop with Sam Thayer, I think is full. I think there's a pretty big wait list for that. Oh, good. Probably has everything to do with Sam and not me, but uh, we're excited for that. That, it's still that works wandering. still. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could join the wait list if you want, or you could attend a future workshop. Yeah. We tend to do a couple events together every year, but unfortunately with the circumstances this year, this might be the only one that we can pull off, but we're still going to try to make it happen. Well, man, I want to say I'm really glad our uh, paths crossed again. And, um, it's just awesome to see what you've done in this last decade since I've seen you. And, uh, gr- just really grateful to have you as a colleague. And I haven't got to go through your mushroom program yet but um i can tell how detail oriented you are so i feel like uh this is going to be something really worth checking out so i'm going to be taking a peek at that and uh yeah just looking forward to getting together man and uh, doing some foraging together yeah thanks i mean i know i talked to you about this before we uh, recorded the call but you've been a huge influence and i appreciate it so it's a real honor to be on this show and uh keep up the great work i mean it's nothing short of amazing what you're doing what you you have accomplished i really appreciate that man yeah you're welcome take care thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.